Thank you for coming back with us with our customer service initiative for the Alabama Department of Public Health. My name is Charlene Smith and I'm with Troy University. And today's session is about proper telephone and email etiquette. Sometimes we get kind of feel stuffy when we say the word etiquette. So another way of saying it is just the proper techniques for the telephone and email. Most of us think we have this down pat. I mean, we've been dealing with a phone almost uh, from the time we're walking, learning to walk on, and of course email the same way for most of us. But there are some techniques that change over time that is considered more professional. Hang with me through this presentation, and I know you'll be great at it by the time we finish. The participants in this session will be able to receive and place telephone calls with professionalism and with accuracy. They'll be able to write and respond to emails in a manner that takes into account the absence of the face-to-face -face communication. Let me stop there just a second because I want to trace back to, I believe it was session uh, two or three, that actually talked about the fact that when we communicate face-to-face, -face, we have 100% of our believability. But that if we looked at it, our nonverbal, our motions, our gestures, our movement, our facial expressions are 55% of that communication. So when we look at what do we have with email and with telephone, we're really limiting that, especially with email, because you're down to only the words, which are 7% of the believability. You may say, if you don't remember, what in the heck is she talking about with believability? And what I mean by that is when you say something, you want the other person to trust and perceive you as credible in your communications. That's what I mean by believability. So let's get to our last objective for today. Model the professional manners and protocol for customer interaction via electronic communications. So let's get right into this. Talking about telephone and email etiquette is really, in essence, nothing more than proper conduct and presenting yourself favorably. And don't we really try to do that with almost everything we do? So let's look at telephone techniques first. And this, remember, from my last session, session three, is about customer service experience, the journey. We even label the times that you connect directly with a customer is called a touch point. So we're going to look at the different touch points that we have so that we can influence someone positive as far as their customer service experience. Please remember, too, we're not just talking about external customers, patients, citizens, the public. But we're also talking about our internal customer at Public Health, which is each other, our coworkers, whether in our division or bureau or in another one. As we get started, what we want to look at is what do you actually say about ADPH by your telephone techniques? I had a call last night to a client who told me to call her. I was uh, off work at about 8 o'clock. I called. And, of course, one of the things is I'm on personal time. It makes me think I can say, hey, you told me to call you or I'm returning your phone call. But you, I, I needed to go ahead and say, even though she knew me and was expecting my call, Hey, this is Charlene Smith with Troy University. I'm returning your phone call. So the idea is we've got to really be aware because we are so, you know, the telephone with our cell phones in particular and our email, that's almost like routine now. So we have to be very careful about it. So as we look at telephone techniques, what do your telephone techniques say about you? Does it say that you're apathetic, that you're looking at this as routine, there's boredom, indifference, annoyance, impatience? Or does it say enthusiastic, helpful, courteous, caring, patient, and understanding? One thing we want to remember through all this, because it's a primary goal for me as a trainer, is to remember that each one of these touch points comes down to one simple fact and that is a behavior change. Telephone and email, y'all, is not so complicated that we have to research it, understand it, 
practice it, if you will. But the idea is it's simply you and I need to be responsible enough in our positions to say, I'm going to change that behavior. There's a lot of times during the day we're rushed, we're busy, our mind is on something else. Maybe we're even doing something, writing an email and the telephone rings. We have to consciously be able to train our, our behavior, if you will, to change so that we are enthusiastic, so that we do um, look like that we are very customer service oriented, helpful, courteous, uh, empathetic in what we show. When we look at the telephone, it's usually the first contact that an cu outside customer has with the Department of Public Health. It's also a continual source of contact between coworkers. For that reason, telephone techniques can make or break the reputation of your department. And remember, a person never gets a second chance to make that first impression. And we'll talk about that impression a little bit later. What do you look for? I mean you. When you call a business, what do you look for in someone that answers the phone? And without going to the next slide, I mean the first thing I want them to do is identify themselves because knowing me, I might have called the wrong number. Or maybe it's that I want them to be polite and very open to what I was saying. One of the examples that I gave, I think it was in the first session, um, and if not, I'll tell you a little bit about it. I was on the way to work one morning, and a uh, van, a business van, ran me off the road, whether he knew it or not, and I ended up meeting behind him at the next light where it said, call this number to report my driving. So I did. The person that answered the phone did answer with the company name, but the Second thing was, what, what can I do for you? That's okay, but I said immediately, one of your vans, number blah, 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 actually ran me off the road. And the answer to that was nothing but, well, how do I know you're telling the truth? So immediately, what does the customer do? They become defensive and start to come back. So the idea with it is, and one of the things we've talked about continually, is you and I, as representatives of the department, need to sharpen our listening skills in what we do. So let's really look at this. What do you expect when someone is answering the phone? Wait for the second ring. Now this may seem a little uh, detail specific, but this is what we're supposed to do as professionals. The second ring. Don't pick it up immediately if you're sitting right there. Let it ring a second time. Why? Because the caller then adjusts, is ready for you to pick it up, and that would be the way that you could start the conversation properly. If they're out of sorts because they're expecting it to ring forever, then second ring is a good indication. Next, smile. Smiling is very important because when you and I smile, it actually changes the tone of our voice. You can tell when somebody is smiling. Identify your department and your division and the breakdown from there is up to you, but maybe your office, whatever it would be. But for Charlene Smith, for me, it would be, um, this is Charlene Smith with Troy University, the Department of Continuing Education. So your department, your division, identify yourself and by the way, that is your first name and your last name. Use an appropriate greeting that really conveys a willingness to help, which is, how may I help you? What can I do for you today? So again, let me go over it real quick. Answer in the second ring. Smile. Identify your department and division. Identify yourself. Use an appropriate greeting that conveys a willingness to help. A proper greeting is warm, friendly, professional, and it does include the department name, the division office name, and the employee's full name who answered the call. It's always suggested that a greeting uh, end with a very helpful statement. That assures that the caller knows someone is willing to help. When you place somebody on hold, Always ask permission. 
would probably do that to this type of statement. Can you hold, please? That's kind of abrupt, and we need to really be able to expand that a little, little more, like the examples you see on the slide. If they ask why, we're even responsible to tell them why. Examples would be, would you mind holding while I get your file? Can you hold briefly while I see if Mr. Jones is available? Another one would be that we're going to look at is what if another phone rings? So it would be, would you mind holding while I get this second line? I will be right back with you. So the idea is to try and give them not only the question about holding, but also why you're going to hold. Because the customers deserve that, they are the customers. Also with pl placing a person on hold, ask permission and then get the caller's attention when returning. So if I place somebody on hold, I ask their permission and I also tell them why. When I come back to that person, that hold, then I need to get their attention. And it's got to be something more than, okay, I'm back. It needs to be, Mr. Jones, uh, thank you for holding. Let's continue with our conversation. Or, now what can I do for you today? Always place a caller on hold. Do not just cover a mouthpiece with a hand. Thank the, um, the caller every time you return for the fact that they were holding. When taking a caller off hold, Again, thank them, call them by name, and if it's necessary to leave the line, explain the reason and excuse the interruption. And we're going to go over this in just a little bit, but one of the things is, let's say that I'm on the phone, someone comes into my office and indicates they need to talk to me right now. Or maybe I'm at uh, the front desk at a clinic and I'm talking on the phone and a patient comes in. The idea would be that I've got two customers that I've got to handle. Now, what I've seen happen over and over again, and I'm going to be honest, the place I see it the most is uh, the registration desk at hotels because I'm actually uh, out of town a lot with, with training. And one thing I see, if I walk in and they're on the phone, they will stay on the phone and indicate nothing to me or to someone or to the person on the phone. So we're going to talk about that too. So if you leave the line, explain the reason and excuse an interruption that comes in. If it's going to be longer than one or two minutes, explain to the caller why this is going to be an extended hold. If a customer is talking in person, and the phone rings, this is like the example of the hotel, give a pardon to the person that is there face to face and tell the customer that you're going to get the line, then answer the phone. You then ask the caller to wait for a moment or offer to call them back. So just a general rule of thumb, easy way to remember it is, whoever you're talking to first is the one you immediately come back to. So if the face-to-face -face happens first, then I'm going to put the caller on hold and come back to the person who's face-to-face. -face. If I'm on a call and a person comes in, I'm going to pardon myself, ask them to wait just a minute, that you'll be finished with the phone call, go back to the phone and complete that phone call. Some other ideas for placing a person on hold. If a customer approaches you on the phone, and this is what I was telling you a minute ago, while you're on the phone, excuse yourself briefly and acknowledge the visitor. If the visitor can wait a moment while you finish your phone call, and of course they can unless it is an emergency. By the way, it's courteous to let the caller always hang up first. Now this was something that has been around, but it has not been emphasized as much. But it is considered today something that, that must, should be done when we are dealing with the telephone. Whoever makes the call, initiates the call, is the one who should hang up first. Now, I know that at times on a cell phone, I don't know how many of you deal with cell phones all the time in your professional life, 
But one of the things with the cell phone, we know that that disconnect can take a couple of seconds, maybe even five to 20 seconds. But the idea still is let whoever initiated the call be the one to hang up first. And then, of course, that would disconnect from your phone. Now let's look at how do we transfer calls. If the caller needs to speak to another person, please transfer the call directly, not to an operator or some third party. Now, let me explain that for just a minute because I understand that um, even though we've become extremely, let me say, uh, direct, meaning there are not as many receptionists, there are not as many administrative assistants, when, if I'm transferring the call to another office, and if, unless it's directed by that other person to go to their administrative assistant, I should be going directly to the person the caller asked for. That's why some of us it, it need to start identifying, do we want our calls directly, or should they go to the administrative assistant? Either one would be proper, we just need to make sure that um, other employees, coworkers, know where to transfer calls. So it always goes directly to the person, if at all possible. Explain the reason for the transfer to the caller. For instance, um, I'm transferring you to Ms. Smith because she is in another office or because I do not handle that information. So we've got to give a reason for that. And when transferring a caller, tell them who you're transferring them to. Announce to the receiver that the call is being transferred. Now, I know when I worked in large offices, and I guess I'm meaning uh, there at times when I was at state personnel as their training director, I would get a lot of calls that would just say, transferring a call, click. And then what happens is, I don't know if the caller's there, the caller doesn't know if I'm there. So it's this awkward pause that kind of goes something like this. Hello? Hello? Yes, I'm here. Hey, this is Charlene Smith. Can I help you? So it's too abrupt. The idea is that we need to announce. If I'm the one transferring, I would say, for instance, to a caller, Mr. Jones, I'm transferring you to Mr. Black because he's the one that actually deals with this directly and can definitely um, handle your uh, comment, complaint, whatever it is. Then when Mr. Black picks up, I say, Mr. Black, this is Charlene Smith. I have Mr. Jones on the line for you regarding such and such information. As soon as Mr. Black speaks to Mr. Jones, that's when I can cut off the transfer from my side. So if we're looking at transferring, there's a lot of communication that goes on there. You can either write the names down, or if you're good, your memory's great, you can do it just the way I explained. Also, with transferring a call, use the name of the employee to whom the caller is being transferred, and please know the transfer instructions for the telephone system so that you don't disconnect the caller. That was one reason that many times I would let somebody else transfer a call because now I'm a little bit ashamed of this, but I really have a hard time with any electronic, especially back when it was first beginning, electronic equipment. So I would cut people off or I'd lose them or they'd transfer, but I didn't know they transferred, so I would still be on the line trying to talk. The idea is we really have to get to know and one thing, y'all, is with the telephone systems that we have, they've so upgraded over the last 15 years that it should be a process that is fairly simple at this point. How do you take phone messages? What would be the proper way to take a phone message? A lot of times we'll get a message from somebody that'll say a name and number. Not enough. When taking a phone message for someone, always be... Um, sure that you include the caller's full name, spell correctly, the caller's organization, department, whatever it would be, if it applies. Of course, that would not be the case with a citizen calling. Complete the, do the complete phone number because one of the things we've got to think about here is the more that citizens 
in particular outside of your department use cell phones, area codes can be literally from all over the place because people now when they move keep their same phone number so make sure you take the complete phone number. The date and time of the call and always try and get the nature of the phone call. What is it is regarding because I'm sure you would appreciate that this too. When we get a message before we make that call, it'd be nice to be able to be in the frame of mind knowing what we're going to talk about or perhaps even getting the information we need to make that phone call. So what do we need to write down? Who is the message for? Who is the message from? What is the message? Is there an urgency for that call? When was the message taken? When is the uh, caller available for a return phone call? Where is the call to be placed? Is it a cell phone? Is it an office phone? What would it be? Now, I want to go back just a minute to when is the caller available for a call back. This may be important because, y'all, as our lives are so busy, and I'm just going to give you a personal example. A lot of times when somebody calls me about something, we're going to play phone tag. They work 8 to 5. I work 8 to 5. They'll be out of their office. I'm probably on the road or somewhere training at the time. So a lot of times when I call and call them back and they say, for instance, I can't talk right now, I will say, even if they don't ask me, I will say something like, well, I will be available not today but from 8 until 10 o'clock in the morning. After that, I'm at, at a training session. So what that does is give them automatically, and we don't play when I'm available, and we don't play this incessant uh, phone tag that we do with people nowadays. We've got to obtain the correct information. I just want to emphasize a little bit more. Ask the person to spell the name if you're in doubt. Ask the person to repeat the number. Always repeat and read back the message for accuracy. Just like you take it down, so Mr. Black is to call Mr. Jones at, you know, 334-222-222 regarding and then read what it's regarding. You want to make sure that this is done so that we make sure if Mr. Jones is calling back, we know that he's going to get in the part, get to the party. I want to go back and explain because a lot of this just seems, you know, um, procedure after procedure, and it is because it's about behavior change. There's not really a lot to think about the why we're training this or different examples, so it is just procedure after procedure. But I want to give you an, an example with pre repeating the number. One of the things that I found are most helpful to people is you give your number up front. Let's say I get a voicemail. I would say, this is Charlene Smith. I would like you to return my phone call at, and I will give the number. Then I'll say, this is concerning, you know, A, B, and C. One more time, my phone number is, and then I give the number again, and it's the last thing I say before thank you or I look forward to talking to you. Because if somebody is writing down the, the actual caller, is taking down your number, they've let it bypass the first time. But they've grabbed a pencil by the time you repeat your number the second time. How do we go about scheduling appointments and meetings via the telephone with the type schedules we have? One of the best things to do especially if it's an assistant or we're taking uh, a meeting or an appointment for someone else, is to ask, when was the last time you saw Mr. Smith? We want to do that to determine whether the customer is someone who is established. Now, this is going to be important for some of your divisions, maybe not so for others, because if we just have a citizen calling in, and I'm, I'm going to call it like a random phone call coming in. The idea is the answer is going to be, I've never called here before. So you still want to get that information down so that when Mr. Smith returns his phone call, he knows that it's either a first time or it's somebody who he's talked to three or four times. If you're going to schedule an appointment, 
suggest two appointment times at least two hours apart. So what I normally do when I'm scheduling an appointment is I just give two different days because I know that if someone is busy one day, maybe the next day is free, those type things. But if you're going to give appointments on the same day, such as um, I have or, you know, Mr. Smith has a 10 o'clock open, you don't want to say, and a 12 o'clock. You want to say a 10 o'clock and maybe a 3 o'clock. Separate them by at least two hours. As you get off the phone, reconfirm the time of the day and thank that customer for giving you that call. Now, what about when we answer calls for other people? The same thing, identify yourself, the office, for whom the phone is being answered and say, how may I help you? If the person they want to speak to is not available, it is important that we say, she or he is not in today, perhaps I may be of assistance. And y'all, the reason is, is because, uh, in fact, last night I was helping one of my neighbors out by trying to hunt down someone in city government here in Montgomery. Um, and obviously, if you're doing it on the website, you're not going to get the actual desk phone. And really, all my neighbor wanted was the office of something where she could gain some information as a citizen. Uh, she's new to the area. So one of the things, you know, that I did was make sure when I was writing this down for her, I'd say, this is the office of so-and-so. Obviously, you may not be speaking directly with him and put his name. Because when we call, it's really not she needs to talk to the director or the vice president of whatever company or government it is, what she needs to do is ask a question that probably almost anyone in the, in the office could answer. So make sure that when we're answering for someone else, that we ask, she's not in, maybe I can help you with this. Because chances are, pretty high chances, that we're going to be able to make that connection, help that caller at that time. Some other things about answering phone, uh, phone calls for others. Don't make commitments for other people. Say, I'll give him your message when he returns rather than this. He will call you as soon as he returns. And a lot of us do this with great intentions of trying to sound we are so helpful. He is going to walk in this door and, buddy, you're the first thing he's going to pick up the phone and call. But we really don't know that. So a proper response, I'll give him your message when he returns. Take accurate, legible messages. Again, just to reiterate, with time, date, reason for the call, what the urgency is, and of course the organization represented. The best time to reach them, and of course other pertinent information. Now what about placing calls? Placing calls, we... <laughs> We probably do this 15 times a day, personally and professionally. But one of the first things you want to do is identify yourself and your department. This is Charlene Smith from Troy University. This is um, Jamie Durham from the Alabama Department of Public Health. If the person being called sounds busy, it is always professional to ask if you could Call them back at a more convenient time. Don't take for granted that at that moment you're their most pressing matter. If it's desired to have you return the call at another time, state your name, telephone number, and a time that you can be reached. Plan the call. Before you pick up the phone and call, knowing what is needed will make the call a little briefer and more effective. One of the things we need to do, and we don't, now we just dial a phone number, breathe deep, and by that time they've answered it on the second ring, and then we go, well, let me think what it was. We don't want to be doing that. Plan your call ahead of time. If your party isn't available, try stating the nature of your call. Y'all, again, we need to be prepared to leave a message that is coherent, or if someone else could assist us, we need to be prepared to actually talk about what it is so they said, oh, I can help you with this. 
or there's someone else in the office that can help you with it. They just need the chance to be able to help you. Now, how do we handle more than one call? Calmly excuse yourself. Good morning. May I put you on hold for a moment while I answer the other line? Or will you please excuse me for a moment while I answer the other call? Then put them on hold, not your hand over the receiver. Answer the other call and ask them, can you put them on hold? Then you return promptly to the original call. Earlier today, we talked about the fact of what happens if someone comes in and you're on the phone or someone is standing there and the phone rings. This is when you actually have two telephone calls coming in at about the same time. Same principle, you always finish your conversation with the person who was first within interaction with you and then take the other call. Effective voicemails. We have to deal with that now. We almost dread that now. Prepare for a voicemail. If for some reason you suffer a mental block, which I do a lot, hang up and call back when prepared. So let's say that I want to uh, call my drugstore. And I dial the number, but something else gets my attention. Well, I mean, I need my, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I need my drugstore to know who it is, what I'm calling for. So one of the things I do, I make myself stand there staring at whatever prescription it is that I need refilled because now and then I'm not spacey, but I get so distracted, I can turn and see something and then my mind's gone from what I'm trying to do. If you suffer from a mental block, like I do on occasion, just hang up, recollect your thoughts, and then what you're going to do is call them right back. When leaving numbers, telephone numbers, slow your speaking pace and add a courtesy of repeating the number at the end of the message. A lot of times I will say it like this. And one more time, this is Charlene Smith at 334 one two one two one two one two, or whatever the the number is. Other things for effective voicemail: spell your name when appropriate. Here's an example: many people know how to spell Charlene Smith. If they don't, I'm not sure what to think about them. But the idea is this: that when I, I say this is Charlene Smith, and then I'll go back and say. S-H-A-R-L-E-E-N, Smith. So I'll say my name, spell the first name that's often misspelled, and then say the last name again. Always state the purpose of your call. Charlene Smith, I'm calling regarding whatever it is. Never leave personal information on voicemail. So especially here in the Department of Public Health, if you are calling regarding some, and I'm going to call it confidential or content information, remember that is not something that you leave on a voicemail. Close the message with the direction on how they need to respond. Sometimes we make the return call, uh, and it's unnecessary. Uh, for the person to do so. It may be that, just let me know you've received this information. They could drop you an email, they could text you, whatever the case may be. But we need to let them know, do I need to speak to you in person, or is it something that you can just email me? What this is doing is simplifying our customers' need to respond to us. And in the end, y'all, it actually helps us too. If we could minimize the phone calls and something could be answered by email, that's easier for us too. But the first priority is to make sure it's what's easiest for the customer. How do, in a voicemail, when someone returns to the office and they have ten voicemails, five voicemails, how do you get yours returned? What I've done is put together some things that will actually help the chance of you getting yours returned even first. 
An example is, after you state your name, say, I have the document you requested. Or it could be something like this. The report you were asking for, report XYZ, I have that ready for you. I look forward to talking to you and, of course, leave the number again. A second one, I need your information so that I can get you the document you requested, report XYZ. A third thing is, when we spoke last week, you told me to give you a call about the document or what about an appointment, about whatever it is. So you're reminding them that you actually, um, they were the ones that actually told you to call them. Some others, Mr. Jones told me that you would be interested in speaking to me about whatever it is. Because what we do is connect his, his or her mind, our customer, back to Mr. Jones. They make the connection with us, and then they're ready to call us back because they know what it's about. Another one, if, you do not, if I do not hear from you by September 1, I will assume you approve of whatever action or document that is going to be uh, that you are referring to. So if I don't hear from you by September 1, some people, especially those that are a little more sensitive, think that they may be, that may be pushy or aggressive by saying, well, if I don't hear from you from September, by September 1, that's it. That's not what you're saying, and it's also your tone of voice. If you say it like this, if I don't, I tell you what, if I don't hear from you by September 1, I'm going to assume that you approve what we talked about. If not, please return my phone call at and then give them the phone number. So as we're talking over the phone, how do we make sure that we are projecting a positive attitude each time? Number one is speak slowly and clearly. As a trainer, I'm constantly having to slow myself down because if it was up to me, I would probably be talking about this fast every time because a lot of the information I know in my head, I'm not having to read, I'm not having to look at it. And y'all, it's the same way on the telephone. We know, for the most part, what we're calling about. So we end up talking a lot faster. What we need to do is speak slowly and clearly, giving pauses to where when the person is on the telephone or voicemail, or whatever it would be, when we're placing the phone call, they, their mind has a chance to catch up to ours about what the call is. Use basic phrases of courtesy. May I help you? Please, thank you. You're welcome. Those are very, uh, obviously, professional, but that is very proper to do today. And I hated to even put this in there, but I do, I do think it's important. Do not chew gum, eat, or drink while you're talking on the phone. Be friendly, but don't waste people's time. You do want to, how are you today? And if they start going into it, yeah, I know the same thing. It is so hot out there. I don't know what to do. The other day, my cat didn't have any water. I mean, you don't want to get into all that, but you do want to spend enough time making them feel like you're being friendly. Use standard accepted business phrases. Use a quality tone and volume when you're speaking, and it's very important with your department that you refrain from using agency jargon, such as Form 186P. That's not a form. I think I actually made that up. But the idea with it is if a customer or citizen is calling, they don't know what form to which you're referring. All they know is you said a bunch of numbers. So if Let's say, because some of you are probably saying, but that is the form. What else am I supposed to say? Here would be an example. Um, and I won't start with the whole conversation, but it would be, well, thank you for your call first. And let me tell you that the form that needs to be completed is the uh, waiver of accountability. I'm just making that up. The waiver of accountability. Do you have a pencil handy? I'm fixing to give you the number of that form. It is form 186P, as in perfect, 
or pig or whatever you want to say. And that is the waiver of accountability. That's the form that you need to fill out. Now, you can find that on our website if that's the case. But the idea is make it uh, something that they clearly understand. In their minds, they're not thinking public health forms, whatever it be. And, you all know, this also includes medical terminology. If you have to use a word that is something that for a typical citizen would not be something that, that they know off the top of their head, be ready to immediately explain what you mean by that. Additionally, to project a positive attitude, avoid slang, such as, girl, I know that, or, man, I wish that we could do X, Y, Z. Man, is, that's, all that is slang. Turn off any background noise, such as the radio, and what I mean by equipment is, if you have a copier in your office, if you have anything that's making a loud noise, make sure that you turn that off. And I do want to emphasize something that, that I've actually kind of learned by, uh, with my mother, who is hard of hearing, is the more background noise, not that she has, but me as a caller have, the less she's able to hear with a hearing problem. Many of you probably have experienced that with your uh, more elderly uh, or hard of hearing um, friends and family. But we want to make sure that we set a condition on our side of the phone conducive to hearing. Another thing, don't slam down the phone or cut off abruptly. And I don't mean like you're mad and you slam down the phone, but on occasion, we'll just put it down harder because maybe we're looking away to get back to our computer screen. So we end up putting it down hard. Remember, who called you hangs up first, and that needs to be very light if we initiated the phone call. And then um, other things for a positive attitude, smile when speaking. I've already mentioned people can hear you smile. In the conversation, always with a thank you or have a great day. And keep the phone, this is a little, little uh, actually a little tip that will help you with a positive attitude because if you keep the receiver at least two finger widths away from your mouth, you are speaking more clearly. The closer, and many of us put that phone right up to our lips, and everything begins to get kind of, um, I don't know if this is a, a word, but jarbled up. Uh, it, it, with a lot of phones or the receiver on the other end, it almost sounds like everything is running together. So what we want to make sure is you take two fingers and you make sure that a receiver is two finger widths away from your lips when you are speaking. We look overall at maximizing the telephone's powerful potential. We will be given the customer service that we need. Because one of the things we need to remember is a potential customer calling the office forms an opinion about you when you answer the phone within four to six seconds. One, two, three, four. An image is formed of you. An impression is formed of you. Then you have to spend about the next 20 seconds or the entire call defending that if it was a, a nice uh, impression they got or trying to rebut it if you had given them a negative. Uh, impression. So, uh, over the phone, an impression is formed in the first four to six seconds. The person who answers the phone represents the Alabama Department of Public Health to the caller. There are a couple of phrases that will help you with this customer service. So, we're just going to run through these. What I'd hoped is you could keep this entire uh, slideshow, the handout, with you in your desk drawer, whatever it be, so you could remember some of these until they actually become behavior change. So let's start with the first one. Try replacing phrases which have negative connotations with these alternatives. For example, I don't know, should be replaced with, that's a good question. Let me check to find out. I can't do that. 
instead say, let me see what I can do and then strive to get something similar or offer them an alternative. Now, I already know what some of y'all are thinking. She doesn't understand. At times, we can't do that. I get that. But there's a way to say that without just saying no. And we've talked about this in another uh, couple of the sessions along the way. And the idea would be, that's a good question. Or, Let me see what I can do for you. I will call you back today. Well, when you call back, you may say, you know, I've tried everything I could. Unfortunately, that is not something we are able to do. How could I help you meet your goal otherwise, or whatever their call is about? So the idea is not to stop from saying, I can't help you, or no, we don't do that. The idea is how can you say that in a way that makes it actually look positive for the Department of Public Health. Another phrase that, we'll have to be, that we often hear is, well, you're going to have to do ABC. We well, all, the caller doesn't have to do anything. There's a subtle difference between ordering a caller around, which is what you will have to, means, here's something that you could say. All right, here's how we can handle that. You will need to do step one, two, three, if we would like, if you would like to, you know, us to get done what you need to get done. The idea is this. Here's how we, you and I, can handle this. You'll need to do this. Another statement. Just a second. I'll be right back. Even if you put them on hold. Well, it's a lie. You're not going to be right back in a second. Instead, say... It will take about two or three minutes to get this for you. Are you able to hold that long? And to be honest, if it's a citizen who's been trying to get in touch with you, they will probably say, yes, I will wait two or three minutes. Because that's something that in today's term, when you're dealing with not just government, any business, two or, two or three minutes holding is not such a bad time frame. Another one for anti-service phrases that we want to avoid, no. You just don't use the word no, especially at the beginning of a sentence. Because what it conveys is total rejection. Public health, no, we cannot help you. So what you can say, and again, some of these were given early on in our sessions, I would like to help you, however, we are unable to, to do whatever it is. Remember, I would like to help you. Oh, I wish I could help you with this, however. So the however is saying the no part, but in a, a nicer phrase. Some other phrases to avoid, and again, this is slang. Yeah, okay, sure. Can you get that for me? Sure. Can you send that to me? Sure. Use business phrases instead of this slang, such as for yeah, it's yes. For okay, certainly. Sure, what we would say is, of course, I can do this for you. Another phrase that is kind of just slang to me, because it's what we've done to shorten it for ease, is we will say, for instance, hold on. What we've already covered, that's anti-service. What we want to say is let me refer you to Mr. Jones' office, can you hold just a minute or continue the transfer? Another anti-service phrase, if you can hold on one moment, I'll check on that. You know, that even sounds um, something that, that we say in our homes or it's something that we actually say just to be friendly. I'm going to check on that for you. Instead, here's what we need to say. Let me check and get back with you unless you would like to hold for about one minute, two minutes, whatever uh, the time frame would be. Another one, avoiding anti-service phrases. That's not my office. In other words, that's not my job. Instead, say this, I'm not in that division, but let me see if I can assist you. 
Another phrase that again is out of uh, ease for us and considered slang, uh-huh. Use instead the business uh, like phrase that would be, yes, that will be fine. There are a couple of uh, techniques under or wording under how we deliver messages. So we're going to look at a couple of those as we go through. What, what is on this next slide are demanding phrases that actually are more coercive or provide pressure. Phrases such like, you should, you ought to, you must. I call those words that are absolute. In other words, each one of those phrases are actually saying, this is it or nothing. So it's coercion pressure, tends to be demanding. Some other messages that we deliver are sarcasm. And y'all, that sarcasm actually belittles the receiver. Phrases like, well, no doubt. Well, you understand, of course. Or, I'm sure you're aware of that, and then whatever it is. You know, one of the things I learned, and, and this was new to me, even though it was about probably even 15 or 20 years ago, is those phrases, because a lot of times, whether in email or over the phone or in person, I would say things like, well, obviously, we know that such and such. Do you know we really shouldn't be saying, obviously, we all know, because what we're saying to the people who don't know is that we are belittling them or telling them, actually, some people take it, that they are ignorant, they don't know what they're doing with their job. So these three phrases, one more time, because they're important, no doubt, or you understand, of course, or... I'm sure you are aware those are things we want to avoid. Another area that we need to make sure that we avoid are called blaming phrases. In other words, we may not mean this, but we actually say something that makes the receiver, the caller, think that you're blaming it on them. It's their fault. So what are some examples of this? The first one you see listed is, you neglected to specify, I'm going to say, your name and telephone number. That's why you never received a phone call back. You failed to include your address, which is why we could not send this to you. Or, you overlooked enclosing the information we needed in order to serve you. One of the things that you could say here is, and, you know, it's something that I teach all the time in communications, and that is when it is the receiver's fault. Instead of saying you neglected, you failed, you overlooked, one of the things you can say is we never received this information. So you're, what you're putting out there is, well, perhaps the, the mail lost it, or perhaps the email um, rejected your email that gave us that type of information. Another type phrase that, again, is negative and we shouldn't deliver our messages this way are things that are called distrusting phrases that suggest that, even if you don't intend it, that the receiver, the caller, is lying. There are phrases where we begin our sentence with, you state that... This occurred. You claim that this occurred. You say that this occurred. Actually, what comes to mind when I'm thinking of those is almost like, you know, the police taking a witness statement. You state that, blah, 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 and you're supposed to say, yes, I do. I'm telling the truth. So the idea, though, when we use these phrases in common language through the telephone or in person, what we're actually saying is we're not really trusting you, so I'm going to make sure that you know what you said. Another phrase that, it, phrase that kind of sends a, a patronizing message and actually implies perhaps that the receiver, the caller, is not very intelligent, 
it would be something to this effect. We cannot see how you got that mixed up. We cannot see how you comprehended that from the email we sent you. We failed to understand how you did so and so. We are at a loss to know that this was done. Those are patronizing phrases that, yes, we do need to avoid. So as we switch from those, and that's dealing directly, I want to go back to, in your office, your voicemail greeting that people get when you are not available. So let's look at a few of the techniques, the etiquette for voicemail greetings. First of all, change your outgoing message to indicate any time you are going to be absent for an extended period of time or there are office closings. Now, let me go ahead before we all actually get a different idea of what the word extended means. If you are going to be out of the office, even for one business day, one business day, we should change our voicemail greeting. Now, a lot of us think, but I'm going to be back in the next day. I can get those. A lot of times, organizations, not just state government, anywhere, assume, because it is correct, that an eight-hour business hours is when you should return emails or phone calls. And the idea with this is if that's their standard, they're going to hold you to that standard. So what we need to make sure is if we're not going to be in for at least one day, we change our voicemail greeting so that people understand that. Make sure that we even detail the specific dates that we're going to be gone as well as when we will return and what our office hours would be. Provide alternate names and phone numbers as a courtesy, as something that we provide as customer service, names and phone numbers of other people in the office that could actually assist the caller if they need the information that day and you are not available. Now, just a couple of extras regarding telephones. First, check your voicemail regularly and return calls promptly, preferably within the same business day or eight hours, eight business hours. If I receive a phone call at 3 o'clock, let's say I get off at 5, then I actually should return it at the latest by 10 or 11 the next morning. So we want to make sure that when we're looking at business hours, it's the eight-hour day that you work, and that would be the eight hours day of one afternoon and the next morning. And that is suggested, that's nationwide, what would be considered professional techniques in returning phone calls. By the way, it's also the same for emails, unless, and we're going to do emails in a minute, but unless that email, you have to research and get a lot of information together. If you are unable to provide the caller with the requested information on the same day of the call, then call the individual back to advise them that you are still waiting for information, you are still researching the information. In other words, you need more time. Very important, if on one business day, let's say on a Monday, Someone calls and I say, I will get that information to you. And I can't get it back in the next eight business hours. I need to return the phone call and say, just wanted to let you know, I'm still working on your request. However, I was unable to pull the information together during this time frame. Do not place someone on hold before you asking. This is just a reminder because it's something that is so frequently mishandled. Don't allow them to remain on hold for an excessive period of time. Also remember, one more time, that we are customers to each other. Treat your internal calls as well as you do your external calls. Final thought for telephone techniques. Take advantage of every opportunity to practice your communication skills. That means with each phone call.
so that when important occasions arise, you have the gift, the style, the sharpness, the clarity, and the emotional state to affect other people. Last thought I want to leave you with that I started with at the beginning of this session. How effective we make our telephone techniques is 100% our choice. 100% our choice. It's no reason to say we forgot, I didn't know. We need to put this particular, if we're not aware of these, hand out near, near our telephone so that we can practice those because we choose our own behaviors as adults. And we've talked about this before, but that we choose our own behavior. If I fail to begin a new technique for answering a phone, it's not that I didn't know it. It's not that I wasn't provided training. It's that I'm choosing not to be responsible in my position when answering phone calls. So a lot of what we've been learning is simply a matter of you and I changing our behavior to a new standard. So this concludes a part of this session that deals with telephone techniques. Now we're going to switch gears, and I hope you can switch with me, to email techniques. Please remember that, again, this is about a customer service experience. It is their journey the number of phone calls they have to make for one request, and each time they talk to you, and then if they see you in person, this is their customer service journey and the experience they have. Once again, in session three, we came up with a new term that I really want us to remember, and that is touch points. Every time a customer touches the, the Department uh, of Public Health, be it through email, face-to-face, -face, telephone, a letter, whatever it would be, that is called a touch point because we touched our customers in some way. And we want to make sure that as far as our customer service initiative goes, that it is only about excellence, public health excellence. So with our electronic communication, how do we make an impact? Well, whether using the email or telephone, the listener, the reader, does not benefit from all the sensory cues that we've talked about, verbal, visual, vocal. Reactions may become more intensified because of that absence of what we can see. Distractions occur while the citizen is on the phone that can impact not only what they hear, but if we're calling, how we deliver a message. Almost everyone over the phone, and boy y'all, especially in the written word, email, can detect even the slightest error. Listeners, draw conclusions about the intent of your email. Sometimes, Electronic tools can be misused intentionally when a better, source, better method of communication could have been utilized. Let me give you an example about this because we've actually, we actually talked about this but just briefly in our last three sessions. And that is face-to-face -face communication is the best because you have the vocal clearly, as you even see my lips moving. You have my gestures. You have my movements. You have my eye contact, my smile. In other words, facial expressions. And all these help give you, as I've already mentioned, but I want to make an impact with it, 55% believability. If we take that 55%, we switch it to email, you no longer have my nonverbal. You no longer have my tone of voice. Now you're down to 7%. Sometimes what we do to be, I probably don't want to use this, but the word lazy. But let me say it's when I'm applying it to myself. I may be sitting in an office, and one of my coworkers is just down the hall or across campus. And I think about what I need to talk to them about, 
and I just don't want to get on that phone. But boy, it's hot outside. I don't want to walk down across campus or I'm too tired to walk down the hall. So what I do, I shoot them an email. Y'all, we need to start thinking about, as far as email is concerned, because obviously distance with many of our customers that call, we're not going to be able to walk down the hall to them because they're external customers. But we need to start thinking about, is email the most effective way? Because it becomes less efficient if anything we say or do in there distracts from the content message that we're intending. So let's get right into some of the techniques that are considered professional etiquette in today's world. First of all, always use formal, formal grammar. Spelling and grammatical errors deviate from the message and reflect poor on the writer and the organization. Now, I hope you know and can see the errors in this. Or either we did a pretty bad job of proofreading it. The idea, though, as you can see, it's always considered formal. Every email to a customer, especially externally, is considered as formal as the old written, you know, business letter with the business uh, letterhead is considered that formal. A lot of us have not gotten around to thinking it that formal, so we use our text-like language. Not appropriate for email. Number two, we've got to make sure that the spelling is correct, punctuation is correct, and the right choice of words. Let's look at another one. Adjusting to the echelon of the reader ameliorates that the tenacity of the email is gratified. What? Can you believe that? Sometimes, for whatever reason, we think we want to adjust our wording upward. I call them 50 cent words instead of nickel words. Always, always, our emails that we send out should be at a 10th grade reading level. Let me say that one more time. 10th grade reading level. It's the same way with anything that I write. A report, a manual, whether procedure manual, uh, maybe uh, at the same time an email, a letter. What is appropriate when you're in government and you're dealing with citizens or with each other, other departments, a 10th grade reading level is what's appropriate. So if you're one of those that wakes up every morning and finds a new word in the dictionary and you're trying to use it that day, use it with your friends. Don't use it in your email. Another one. Guess what? The state email is like your personal email. Just teasing, smiley face. That is so unprofessional. I don't even know where to start, so I won't. Uh, we'll say one thing. There's no place for these emoticons, the smiley face, in a professional email. So let's look at, those were kind of for humor. I hope you found them humorous. But let's review some of the things that are appropriate. First of all, we're not going to do it here, but review the rules of grammar. Use active voice verbs because using passive voice in your emails actually diminishes the impact that you intend. It also makes the, the whole document completely wordy. Let's, get, let's look at these examples. Passive voice would say, the check was signed by my supervisor. Yo, there's really nothing wrong with that. But let's look at the active voice. My supervisor signed the check. You have five words versus seven words. Also, the active, if you read that again, my supervisor signed the check, has more of an impact. And what I mean by that, impact is perception by the customer, perception by the reader, if it's an internal customer or coworker. Use positive rather than negative statements. It's better to make a point in a positive way if possible, especially if the recipient of the document 
is being criticized based on their actions or what they said or what they did or what they said. For instance, Ms. Andrews, you took way too long to resolve Mr. Black's issue. I can't believe the bind you put everyone in. This cannot happen again. If you run into problems in the future, I need to know about it immediately. Now, maybe this is a supervisor to an employee, coworker to coworker, uh, division head to division, whatever it would be. The idea, though, when we're talking about Ms. Andrews, this example is, all that did was negative pounding. One of the things, if I say, how are we going to correct this? One of the first things you need to know, this email should have never been sent. This needs to be a face-to-face -face communication with Ms. Andrews. So, first of all, should have never been sent. Second thing, if that person is across the state, then maybe we need to pick up the phone. That would be our second choice. And, of course, the last choice would be email. So how do we take this and make it positive? Now, I'm not saying you say, well, Ms. Andrews, congratulations. You get an award for being the biggest, you know, um, screw up in, in public health history. No. Not only is that rude, it's sarcastic and basically unprofessional, everything we've talked about. But here's how you could resolve it, depending upon what the email or what the subject matter really is. Ms. Andrews, we did not receive Mr. Black's form, condition, whatever it is about Mr. Black, in time for us to be able to, I'm just going to say, process in the future, it would be so helpful if we could both or all attend to deadlines. This would help us serve our customers in a more professional manner. You've got to, again, it's like say, we're not supposed to say no. We shouldn't be sending emails that talk so derogatory and downward and direct, uh, be so direct in a confrontational manner. So use positive rather than negative. Another one is to, like we've already said, on the telephone, please avoid any of the technical language jargon if possible. Now, again, you are the Department of um, Public Health, and let me say, y'all have got some jargon just based on the fact that you are in the field of health. All of us know that, but if possible, the technical jargon, big words, flowery statements detract from the meaning of what you're actually trying to say in the email document. And sometimes can actually have the exact opposite effect than the one intended. Let's take a look at this one. Mrs. Jones, it is unfortunate that we cannot account for the delay and offer you any partiality in this regards. You need to complete an SR100 ASAP as soon as possible before we process your request in an opportune time frame. The CMS 2000 pulls from that for processing. Read that one more time. As you read it, immediately you see the, the SR100 form and some type of process, the CMS 2000. That is technical jargon. But the big words, the flowery statement, we cannot account for the delay and offer you any partiality. There is a more direct yet very kind and professional way of saying it. And just the bottom line is the way we communicate now on the phone, in email, or face-to-face, -face, the world has gotten to where what is considered professional is very concise. Very concise. In fact, there, there are many organizations that now that make their own inner, if you will, um, email rules that say, if you've got too much to say, it's all said in a bullet list because it makes it so concise. If we look at another technique that we need to be mindful of with email, we have to have in our emails very specific and definite information. Especially, this becomes important when writing guidelines, instructions, evaluations. Let's look at this example together. Ms. Hicks, 
I'd like to go over the procedure for handling citizen complaints. If you talk with the customers who have a complaint, try to resolve it or involve a supervisor. Be aware that sometimes supervisors aren't available, so you need to use your best judgment. Be specific and definite. This example that was an email being written to a Ms. Hicks, this should have been in some type of outline or bullet form because it's not definite or clear. Let me ask you, if you're Ms. Hicks, read that again. And as you're looking at it, do you, or do you even understand the instructions of or the procedure for how to handle citizen complaints? It's all mixed in. This would have been a really good email to kind of use the bullet points. Then let's go to that last sentence, the very end of it. So you will need to use your best judgment. You've just told me, as Ms. Ms. Hicks, to make sure that I call a supervisor. But now you're telling me the supervisors are not going to be available that often. So use my best judgment. Best judgment. That is so ambiguous. It lacks the clarity. I mean, what is best and what is judgment? Have I been to any training so that, about what the procedure is? So we're going to have to expound on the best judgment if we're going to, to provide definite information for people to act on. Another te technique for email is this. Try and be descriptive without being verbose. When a point needs to be um, elaborated on, describe it in detail without being unnecessarily wordy. Y'all, this one actually just makes me laugh. Hello, colleagues. So obviously this is to an office. A few of you asked for clarification regarding the new software we will be implementing. It goes without saying that an implementation of this magnitude can be overwhelmed be overwhelmingly challenging, to say the very least. Often, implementation of this nature uh, impact agencies in so many ways, as I certainly suspect it will impact ours. I encourage patience as we chart this course together. I hope I've addressed your concerns and remain readily available to respond to additional questions. Well, let me tell you right now, probably no one is going to email back any questions because they're going to expect to get the, a novel in return. The idea with this is what we need to do is be descriptive. I mean, the impact here is, hey, this is going to be a lot. We know you know it. Maybe you don't. But in other words, here's what we're facing. This, again, could have been taken into two sentences and what you would do. So, again, just as a little tip, read your email two or three times and make sure that you are making it as descriptive and concise as you can, but without being verbose. A couple of email tips. The next one is use examples for difficult points. Whenever you're trying to make a point that is difficult to understand, giving a concrete example often clarifies the point more efficiently than a lengthy explanation. For instance, hello everyone, our new policy indicates that an email is not to be relied upon as the sole source of communication. I appreciate your cooperation. Wow. You may say, well, Charlene, that's not difficult. But if you use it, the difficult part is don't use email as a sole source. So the difficulty comes in, I mean, how many emails do we receive a day? I know with me, I receive an average of about 75 emails a day. If we're looking at that and you're saying it shouldn't be the sole source, then which ones do I send by telephone? or in person, or how would you like me to handle that? So we really needed at the end of this an example of emails that we do use and emails that could be better handled another way. 
Another one, the same as we do in telephone calls with an email, avoid slang and colloquialisms. Slang should not be used in formal documents. They distract, once again, from the information being presented. Hey, girl, are you still working on that certificate? Want to meet later this afternoon and figure out what we're doing about it? Again, that sounds like a personal text or a social media post. It definitely should not be a professional email. In addition, use generalizations very sparingly. And when we do use generalizations in emails, make sure that we support it with more of the details. Let's take a look at this example. Hello, colleagues. It seems like every time we meet, no one wants to discuss the ways we can improve our communication with customers. I know that all of us have had poor interactions with customers and that we all need to work on this. How many generalizations do you spot as you look at that email? There's at least four every time we meet. These are some of those absolute words again. All of us, we all need to. So anytime we're bringing everybody together, I'm going to tell you the intent of that. The intent is not to make everybody feel bad. The intent with this email, most of the time, is that people are trying to make it friendly and not single anyone out. But instead what they've done is single everybody out instead of one person. So there's definitely a better way we could have handled that than the generalizations that we have. One of the next tips that we have is about email. Before you hit that send button, what do we need to do? Use a face-to-face -face test for the content of your email. If you wouldn't say it in person, don't send it in an email. So you go back and you read it over and over again. Never rely on email for topics that are sensitive in nature or they're likely going to result in emails being sent back and forth with a lot of different questions. When receiving emails, don't rush to judgment as it could lead to you, by your own perception, misinterpreting uh, the message and the intent of the person who sent it. When you're not sure you understand the tone or the content, follow up by use of the telephone or better yet, in person if possible. Because again, we can start to use the other nonverbal communication methods to validate whether our judgment or our perception was correct and most of the time incorrect in what we were saying. Another tip, before you hit that send button, be sure you've attached all the documents, uh, your email references. Y'all, I just did this last night, sent in a document. Thank goodness it was to my own office. But the fact is, what happens? Somebody emails you back, no document attached. And you go, oh, I can't believe I did that. So one of the things we need to make sure of as we reread the email is check to see if we've referenced any document. Also, before hitting send, make sure you have a subject line and be as descriptive as possible so that when the reader clicks on your email and it opens up fully, they know what to expect with that subject line being the, the hint of what's to come. Again, before you hit send, proof and edit all emails. Is your message clearly written? Do you answer the who, what, when, where, why? Clarify any areas that may not be understood easily. And please don't rely on that spell check as we know, it will not catch anything. I often use as an example with email, when I was at state personnel years ago, I did a lot of correspondence with the personnel managers. That was their technical name at the, 
their classification at the time. And so it was about the holiday season, the 1st of December. And I was sending out something, I'm sure it was about performance appraisal or the discipline process. But here's what it said. It was in a, in a memo format. And it said, two personnel mangers. And then I went on with my email and somebody wrote me and said, did you see what you did instead of managers, you put mangers. And said, but lucky for you, it's December, and that goes along with our Christmas season. I'm glad that one person could laugh, but it sure did make me feel bad. Not that I called them mangers, but that I'd misspelled a word, and of course, spell check won't actually take care of that for me. Something else before you hit send. If you're concerned about how a recipient may convey a particular message, Consider having someone else, a colleague, coworker, supervisor, proofread your email prior to sending. Y'all, this is particularly important when you're delivering bad news that could anger someone, technical news that, that, that you need them to understand immediately, and you're not going to have to talk time to talk to them in person, so it would be instructional in nature, and then also anything that, that unveils negative, um, not just connotations, but you're having to say something negative or that would be conceived as a downer. You want to be able to, to make sure that what you said, the intent and the motive, as well as the content, says what you need it to say. And one of the best ways is to actually have someone else read it alongside you. They don't occur that often so it wouldn't be a bother to anyone that you work with. Also, when hitting the send button, we need to make sure if we're mad or upset, we are, not the recipient. Save our email as a draft and allow yourself time to process the situation, the issue. Then reread it later. And let me say later does not mean 30 minutes. I would give it for... I want to say the majority of us, about a two-hour break, if not a half-day break. Reread it later to gain a different perspective and make necessary edits so that it's professional and your anger does not show through in the least. Another tip, remember every email that you sent represents the Alabama Department of Public Health. Make sure what you're sending makes that representation the best it could possibly be. Also, be mindful of when to copy and blind copy others on an email. The balance is including those who need to be included, not just including people unnecessarily. A lot of times, y'all, we will... We will copy, and let me go with copy first, send a copy and put five or six more people on it, or even one other person. Y'all, the bottom line is, why are you copying them? Are they in on the conversation, so they too should respond to something, or they had already asked that question, so you're copying them for the effect of answering or confirming an answer? There should be a reason that you're sending it before you put somebody in the copy line. Now, blind copies. You have really got to ask yourself about blind copying. Why are you doing it? And I hate to say this, but most people, I don't know if it's true about you, most people blind copy somebody else as almost a defense mechanism or to protect themselves or to let somebody else know I've answered this. Y'all, in every one of those instances, instead of sending a blind copy, we should pick up the phone, call the coworker, most of the time it is coworkers or colleagues, and let them know instead of just adding them to a blind copy. One of the worst things that can happen as far as your trust taking a hit is that the person who is blind copied then accidentally hits Reply all. You've been caught. 
everybody's going to know that that was a blind copy. It's not rocket science. If you weren't in the the um, the copy line and you were uh, in and you, your address was nowhere on there, your name, then you were blind copied. Be careful about that. It could really be harmful, even if you didn't intend that. Before you hit send, another technique. Make sure to include any important deadlines and timelines. This comes into play, most importantly, if you ask a question and you need an answer by a particular date. If you go ahead and put a deadline in there, it lets the reader be able to prioritize of who to answer first after they come back into the office. So make sure that you please put a, a deadline and to be even um, more effective, put that deadline along with the content in your subject line. You know, answer to such and such question by 5 o'clock today, whatever it would be. Email. Before hitting send, avoid sending an email where we include multiple topics in a single message. Because, number one, your message becomes convoluted. Number two, keeping your message focused on a single topic allows the recipient to appropriately file your email under a certain category. And y'all, we can't depend on the fact of whether the way we organize our email files is going to be the same way the recipient e files their emails. We all have different filing systems and the way that we think. So what you want to do is make sure each email, even if I have two things to say to you, that I would send two different emails. That's going to be best all around. Now, if there's something, and let me give, let me give you an example. <clears throat> About every month since my coworkers are not in Montgomery, they're in Troy, Alabama, and Dothan, Alabama, and I'm sending, like, a message once a month saying, here are the types of things I'm working on or places I'll be speaking in the coming month or these are questions that I need or requests I have for the upcoming month, then what I'm going to title it is something that would say update requested for the month of August. We're in July. Uh, or my update of work for the month of August. Because what that immediately does is let the recipients know this is going to be about a lot of different things. And then what am I going to do? My format's going to be different. I'm going to actually do things in more of a bullet format. And you may think, well, that's not professional. It needs to be with a heading and good morning. Yes, you put all that. You also put a signature line. But your first one is the following list represents uh, what I will be actively involved in in the month of August. Bullet one, bullet two, bullet three, and so forth. Because when you are trying to do some type of an update, very important to say that in the actual subject line. Let's look at some more tips. Everybody read this example of an email. You can see it's from Charlene Smith at Troy to Lee Vardaman at Troy. It is actually CC to perhaps a Bridget Jones and a Harry Cassidy. Of course, these are made up. The date, the subject, is everything ready for the conference? Sounds pretty good. It's just something saying Give me a yes or no. Do I need to help you with anything? But let's look at what it actually says. First of all, we're going to go to the copy line. What does Bridget and Harry actually have to do with this? Are they just additional coworkers? Because if I'm asking only that Lee Vardaman answer, is everything ready? 
Why am I copying two other people? See, if they're supposed to tell me if they're ready, then it should be in the from. Excuse me, to line, I'm sorry. So it should be something that, that up front, if it's in the to line, then each email address, I'm expecting a returned email. Let's look at a second point. The subject line is empty. And what that actually does is minimize the importance of the message when it comes in. People are going to go to messages if they've received a lot of them, the ones that have subject lines first. Another aspect of this example, what in the world is everything? Is everything ready for the conference? Well, I don't know what part are you referring to. We spent a year putting the conference together. So, you know, we had a meeting last week. What part of everything are you referring to? Obviously, it's generalizations that are made that we should be more specific with. Lastly, if you look at the email, S. That could be a nickname. That could be somebody that's not even on the list of addresses. We need to know what and who S is, what does it mean, where is the contact information. Now, I'm going to let you know what S means there. There's this, in this example, I'm saying there's a standard joke between Smith and Vardaman that Vardaman is known as S, like on the Superman shirt. Again, what we're trying to do here is bring in inner office humor, which is not what email is for. So the idea would be is that emails need, even with internal coworkers, consultants, people that we, we work with, our emails should be formal. Save the inner office jokes for another time. It's an important consideration if we're looking at email that the messages represent organizations from which they originate. And our judgment in writing those should be exercised accordingly. Email messages are not temporary. They're stored. And by the way, sometimes in locations beyond management's control, even after they've been deleted by the sender or receiver. The recipient of an email can retain it indefinitely. Doesn't matter what I put and how bad I want to go delete it. The recipient can retain it, maintaining the ability to make copies, forward, or even misdirect the email message. Another point. If two people have exchanged emails two times, that calls for a face-to-face -me -face meeting or a telephone call. Y'all, this is something that is new to the email. Well, it's been around maybe about two or three years. We take email as an easy, lack of effort way to have to communicate with people sometimes. And sometimes, whether initially or it becomes cumbersome through the email exchange, that it's become a bigger discussion than we intended, we need to vacate, we need to leave, we need to get away from the use of email if that occurs. So what is considered professional at this time with email is, like let's say that, um, that I've emailed a guy named Dan Black. Dan Black, his emails me back. I now email Mr. Black again. Mr. Black now emails me again. I've emailed twice, Mr. Black's emailed twice. If we don't have it finalized, understood, then after that fourth, to from the recipient, to from the initiator of the email, then it immediately goes to a telephone or a face-to-face -face meeting. And you all, most of the time, this isn't with outside external customers. This is internally, where we go back and forth with people. So I want to see that put into practice. It's one of the newer areas. Not a lot of people have heard about it, but it's something we need to start practicing in our department 
of public health. Again, if I've responded twice and I've heard back twice from the recipient, no more email, let's get face-to-face -face or voice-to-voice. -voice. Some other tips about email. Always use the out-of-office. Out-of-office is just like your voicemail. When you leave a message, that you will not be answering your voicemail. You're out of the office on vacation or on a business trip. Always use the out-of-office function when you're unavailable for one day or more. So as you can see, you're starting to see that there are a lot of similarities between the telephone and email. Indicate in your out-of-office message the date and time you will return, whether you will or will not be checking your email during your absence. Very important right there. The name and number or email address of an alternate contact in your office that could possibly help the person while you're away. Let me go back to just one. Please notify in that message whether on your out-of-the-office experience you will be answering email. Because if I send you something, can I expect an answer? Or do I expect to hear from you after the date that you have put forward? Do not indicate at any point that you will be out of town. Do not indicate at any point that you will be out of town. It's, I will be out of the office during these dates. Y'all, you don't have to say to a conference, on a business, you know, on a business trip, you don't have to say, I'm on vacation, I'm on sick leave. It, it's not important. All that needs to be said is, I will be out of the office on these dates. I will or will not be checking messages or available to check messages. And then when the, the start time, if you will, that you will be back in the office to actually receive theirs. And then there's that final point. That final point is, is there anybody in the office, including their contact information, that this um, email writer, the initiator, could contact because you will be away. That's how to handle some of the out of office that we have. We're ending this session, I think, with a humorous look, but I hope important. Final thought about emails. Diamonds are forever, but email comes close. That was said by someone who's a correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. And as we know, the media has learned the hard way about emails being intercepted. So let me finish up the summary of email and telephone. We have looked at, in session one, the basic and the high-level needs of our customer. Obviously, when we're meeting those needs, it has to be said or done in a professional way. Business etiquette, telephone and email technique. We've also talked about, in session three, I believe it was, two and three, about basic and advanced communication skills in servicing our customers. We went pretty extensive into those, including even barriers that keep us apart. And you know it's the same. When we step back from the situation with an internal or external customer, email and telephone are simply still communication coming from us. So whether it's in person, telephone, or email, it is us delivering services to our customers. One of the best ways to make an impression that's favorable of you, favorable of state government, and most importantly, favorable for the Department of, the Public, of Public Health is for you to put your best foot forward. How do you do that? Simple. It's behavior change. Again, every session I've had with y'all is not about doing something where you have to be sent to training in order to gain a knowledge. Much of this is a reminder. There are a few things that you've learned in past sessions, and maybe even one or two in today's session. 
But the idea is you are responsible for change. You are the person that needs to step forward. Not necessarily your employee, your coworker, that person, this person, you. If you've used this, then it can be expected that every email, every telephone call will be filled with the proper techniques we've learned here today. I can hear you. Charlene, you just said every. Isn't that a generalization? Yes. I didn't send it an email, but it is a generalization. But what could I expect? Well, I'm going to put some, some deadlines for you. By October 1st of this year, the first of the fiscal, new fiscal year, if everything that we've talked about during the seven sessions, we have some upcoming, every session, any behavior, action that we've talked about, service, technique, thoughts that become our actions, all of those within the next two months we should have implemented. A lot of us go to, I'm, you know, I'm talking to me too. We go to something, we hear a session, we hear training, we hear updates, and we just sit and listen and we don't think about when I get up from this chair, when I pick up that phone, when I type that next email, how am I going to be different? And that's what I want you to think of. How, what, when am I going to behave differently based on what we've learned? Whether you knew some of it already or whether this is brand new information. The idea is implementing what we've learned. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. You could send them here to the video communications so that we can answer those in an upcoming session because we really do want, if you have any questions, because the idea is I don't want you to get out there starting October 1st and say, well, I didn't understand or I didn't know. Please, please send us any questions you have. So until our next session, session five, have a great time and tend to those emails and telephone calls. Thank you so much.